nature contains the elements in color and form of all pictures as the keyboard contains the notes of all music. But the artist is born to pick and choose that the result may be beautiful as the musician gathers his notes and forms his chords until he brings forth from chaos glorious harmony. Artist James Abbott McNeil Whistler. This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love arts. I'm on a journey to learn how to paint, and you are invited to join me on that journey. To that end, I invite other artists to share some of what they know with you. Now, your art lesson today comes from artist Jill Carver. She's based out of Southwest Colorado, and there she paints the landscape with the keen eye of an observer of nature. She paints in order to know the land. Now, many painters focus on epic sweeping vistas, stopping short of moving in closer to the subject as if they were held back by an invisible force field. Jill, on the other hand, breaks through that force field and moves the viewer in for a closer look at what others may pass by without ever noticing. By zooming into the scene, she captures the essence of the place. Up close, her paintings take on an abstract quality with rich colors, beautiful brush strokes and textures. But as you pull back, her paintings resolve into a scene of contemplative beauty and thoughtfulness. Jill's paintings are a poetic expression of her deep reverence for nature and the landscape. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. So, so Jill, I I really appreciate you being on the Artful Painter podcast. This is a brand new podcast. I think this is going to end up being, I think, episode number six. And it's only logical that I started with people that I met at the uh, Plan Air Painters of America event at the uh, Booth Museum in Cartersville, Georgia, back in March. And you were one of the instructors there. So I said, I got it. I got to talk to as many of these painters as I possibly can. So it's a real it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thanks for inviting me, Carl. I look forward to the chat. And uh, what an incredible week at the Booth Museum that was. I think every one of us had fun down there. Very special. Yeah, I I didn't get to take a course from you, but I did listen to your lecture. I've got notes from that. And uh, we may even touch on some of that. It um, it uh, It was a very encouraging event for a beginner like myself. I learned so much and, and there's probably, I probably have forgotten <laughs> way more than I should. So when I have these conversations, it helps bring it back to mind what I need to be thinking about <laughs> as a painter. Well, I, it's funny, you know, the process of learning because it takes time for this to sink into the brain. And then it takes even more time for it to become part of our process, you know, part of what comes out on the canvas. There's always a delay factor there between what we know and what we're practicing regularly. So um, I always call that (laughs) that time delay is where the frustration kicks in because we're always better painters in our heads than we are on the canvas. So I still go back. Yeah, I still go back and read notes from workshops that I took, you know, eight, 10 years ago. And You know, I'll I'll still hear things for the first time, even though those notes are eight years old. Um, I think it's interesting how we learn like that. We only, I tell my students, you know, you only hear the answers when you have the questions in your head. And um, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, as you evolve, you, you know, you gather more questions and you go back to those old notes and you're like, oh, that's what he was talking about. You know, you you then get it because you've got the question in your head. So, well, I think that's that's, a, that's an excellent point, because oftentimes I, I feel intimidated because I don't know what questions to ask. I don't know enough to ask the question. But when I go back and, like you said, review the notes or attend these workshops or other educational resources, then you begin to formulate those questions. You have more structure uh, to the learning process itself. Right. It's very true. Yeah. In some workshops, I give out cards at the beginning and ask people to put down three questions that they'd like answered. And uh, there's this one chap and he said, well, I don't know what I don't know. Right. So <laughs> how do I know what questions to ask? Well, that's I, I can identify with this with this feeling, though, that, that there right. is a, there, there is um, 
Sometimes you just don't know where, but you know, you just drive, you know, you dive right in and you start. I think about all the different things people try to learn about. And I, I look at the process that they go through. And what I see a lot of times nowadays, we have, we have such a rich resource of learning today that's never been, uh, it's just sure. never been this, this right. popular before. You know, you think about right. what's available on the internet and yeah, you, we go on these binges, you know, <laughs> that's what I do. When mm-hmm. I first got interested in painting, I went to try to find every podcast, everything that I could listen to and to read right. and, and yeah. you go through that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really, um, if you're just starting out, I think it's really useful to make a list of questions as and when you hit against those obstacles is to write them down. Because then when you do have the opportunity to ask someone more experienced, you know, so often we're put on the spot and we're, we're like, well, I know I've got a thousand questions, but, you know, right now I'm just feeling overwhelmed. So I think it's really good to kind of keep a journal of, you know ideas to ask. I know, I know teaching, I love students that come in kind of armed and ready with stuff that they yeah. want to sort out, you know? So, yeah. Well, what would be examples of good questions for us to, to have when we come in? <laughs> want to I want to cheat here. Can we cheat a little bit? Give me a cheat, well, cheat list here. <laughs> well, it's really interesting because um, I just taught about a month ago up in um, some Valley Ketchum area, and we did five days focusing on design. But we did a lot of general, um, you know, brainstorming sessions. It was that kind of inquisitive class. And um, I challenged them on – I had judged Plain Air Eastern this year and had overheard both artists and members of the public saying, well – or judging is subjective. And I took objection to that. Um, <laughs> okay. Because there's certain criteria that make paint certain paintings better than other paintings. So just in the class, we sat down and we came up with a bullet list of, well, what makes a good painting? And that's, that's a pretty good question to start off with. You know, what makes a good painting? And I got them to do the thinking, you know, so we came up with, well, a good idea for starters, you know, and a clear motif and good drawing, good design, good value management, um, consistent light throughout, you know, we came up, I don't know, with about 12 different points on what makes a good painting. Oh, that's Um, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That's a question I'm interested in. What makes a good painting? I'll back up a little bit on that because when I first started learning, I, I was just a casual learner in the beginning. So this has been some time back. And I was a software developer. And so, you know, that's a whole different mindset, it seems like. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. what do you do? You know, you, well, okay, Bob Ross is on public television. <laughs> 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 and, and I realized, okay, I want to be like, I want to paint like Thomas Moran or somebody like that. Or, <laughs> and these Bob Ross paintings are really kind of flat and naive. Now, it's not to put Bob Ross down. He brought in a whole generation right. of, right. of, uh, of, of, of a positive attitude about it, but, but there is a naivety to that type of painting. And so that's, that's the process I've been going through is, okay, what makes a painting good? How do you get that elusive feel of quality in a painting? I want to be in a museum one day. Right. Well, I know as a child, you know, my, it wasn't Bob Ross on British TV. It was a chap called uh, Rolf Harris, um, Australian, a uh, guy that had a TV program called Take Art, I think it was. And I used to come back from school and it lasted 30 minutes. And it was just him with big rolls of news sheet paper, cans of emulsion paint. And for me, it was it was magic, you know, watching him. He'd essentially do a dark tone, a middle tone, and then a light value on this kind of muted paper background. And it was, and he'd, he'd start and he wouldn't tell you what it was going to be. So you were like playing a guessing game on what this was going to materialize as kind of guessing what object it was. And it was like magic unfolding. I mean, the magic of trying to create something that looks three dimensional on a two dimensional surface. Um, And that gets back to, I think, if you really back up, the first question is, wh- why do I want to do this? Mm, um, yes. I, I think um, a lot of my students that are, you know, they're struggling with the frustration and not maybe progressing as fast as they think they should, even though they're probably doing a lot better than they fear. And um, 
some of them become so disillusioned that <laughs> why, why am I doing this? <laughs> and I think you have to back up and remind yourself wh- what why you're embarking on this journey, you know. And for me, it's the magic of that illusion, you know, the th- creating something 3D on a 2D surface. It's a love of nature. And then it's just, I just, if, if I hit a wall and I'm in a real slump, I know I'm going to get back to the point where I just want to smell oil paint and I want to push it around again. Um, so, yeah, it's good to remind yourself why you want to do it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's so true. And I, I, I go through that as well. But uh I, one of the things I've noticed about your paintings, as I as I study uh, the works of uh, contemporary artists today, uh, there it reminds me of a photographer that I knew. He's an instructor hmm. uh, who used the expression "break the force field." Okay, and, and that was a weird saying. I said, well, "What do you mean, break the force field?" He says, "Well, right. he means what he meant was that photographers tend to want to go for the epic wide shot, whereas often, you know, the most interesting photo would be." the ones where the photographer moves in closer to the subject. And and I think that principle can apply to paintings. And I see that in your, there's an intimacy, a close, you, yes. you bring us in close uh, right. to the subject. And I, I just right. wonder how did, how did you develop that idea and why do you do that? Well, I think when I was looking at artists work and again, it gets back to that why question, what you hope to achieve in a painting. Um, I had some, I told this story down in Georgia, but I'll tell it again of painting here in the valley a few years ago and some, it was in the fall and some hunters were out there in the woods and they asked if they could come across and check out what I was doing. And um, they stood there and paused and then they said, are you just painting the scenery? (laughs) (laughs) Which kind of made me freeze because they thought, for it to be an interesting piece of artwork that if I stuck an elk in it, it would be a worthy motif. Um, And what I was actually doing on that day was painting the big wide postcard vista. And um, yeah, I was just painting the scenery. So it kind of hit a nerve with me. Uh, There's nothing wrong with scenery painting, but it's not what I'm about. And I, I really want to get across to people, you know, my passion about the land and um, pursuing the knowledge of what I'm painting. In that sense, painting is the means to the end, you know, in that I paint in order to get to know the land and get to know, you know, the plants and the birds and the trees um, better. So, you know, often by kind of zooming into middle ground or even something closer than that, in many ways, sometimes you can capture the essence of a place uh, more accurately by doing that. Um, and also it's great just to – I often get the feedback saying that I I take scenes that people would normally just pass by and make them, you know, kind of iconic and majestic. And I love having that impact on maybe – changing how people view the landscape when they're passing through it. Yeah. I, one, one thing I, I seem to notice too in your work is, well, it's kind of like uh, you, you probably have seen this effect in the museums. You can tell who an artist is. They're the ones that move it close and they're looking at the brushwork and the texture and then they pull back and the image right. resolves. And that I, I feel like if I were up close to your image, I'd be looking at a, and I mean this in a very nice way, you know, an abstract painting. And then as I pull back, it, it resolves into this place that I can register in my mind. Yes, I enjoy right. that effect. And I love that. I love that. And uh, I think it should work both ways. I, I love the idea of it working well as an abstract close up and having, you know, interesting textures and variety of paint thickness. And then then you kind of get the bigger picture as you step away. Um, yeah, a lot of my neighbors that aren't, you know, educated in art at all um, have that exact reaction to them that they get a little dizzy if they're close up and then it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> <for their age. laughs> I'd love, I love it. I love the textures. I love, I, that's what draws me to a lot of paintings. Um, well, I think there's yeah. a point too, that as a, as a painter, as you evolve, it certainly happened to me too, is that, You know, subject matter comes first, but then, boy, coming close in second place and sometimes in first place comes the actual surface of the painting and how 
you know, just the beauty of the oil paint in itself, you know, in its own right, um, I find fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Now you do, you know, we were at this event. It was called the Plein Air Painters of America. It was sponsored mm-hmm. by the Plein Air Painters of America. And yet um, uh, you do more than just plein air. You're not just outdoor painting. You're also in the studio. And I've often thought about this. And, uh, you know, before we started recording, uh, we, we talked briefly about this. And I want to include this in the show. I, I've had this strong feeling as a novice that a lot of these plein air events are kind of like a, a sporting event. And, right. And 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 I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with someone being labeled as a plein air painter, but I, I just uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I'm I really um, I'm probably more of a studio painter now, even though I still source from outside. And uh, this is something I, I really want to talk about, actually, because I. You know, I made my career, I made my name when I moved to the States um, doing the plein air competitions um, from like 2004 up to 2009. There was like five years there where I was kind of doing the circuit, you know, and um, without a doubt, it improved me tremendously as a painter. And it got me recognition, you know, because I won some awards. I won the respect of my fellow artists and... um, you know, they're probably fellow artists are probably your best form of advertising, I think, yeah. in that word word spreads amongst artists on, you know, who who to watch out for and and um, you know, and then the magazines gave me some coverage. So without a doubt, I think my time on those competitions um kind of made my name in a way. And then I just in all truth, I just hit a wall with them and um I quit. I, fa- I phased out within two years, um, all of them. Um, and what, what was the wall? What happened? Partly what you're referring to in the atmosphere of mm. it being a sporting event. Um, it was just, um, it became, I felt the content became a little gimmicky in that, um, you know, I was doing them back in the old day. <laughs> <laughs> they were not as fiercely competitive as they are now. There's some incredible work being produced in the current plein air competitions. Part part of what I hit a wall was I started feeling a little bit of a phony in that I was traveling to places and landscapes that I didn't know very well and um, trying to bag paintings. You know, you're trying to drive around looking for for paintings and it wasn't the kind of intimate ongoing conversation with the landscape that I began to feel like I needed to do to evolve. And part of it was it became so gimmicky, you know, um, the nocturne thing kind of took off and I thought, well, geez, I've been painting all day and now I have to paint through the cocktail hour too. Are you kidding me? You know, and well, then there's a good whiskey then, waiting for it. <laughs> exactly. And then people started scaling up and I just thought it's getting, it's getting a little too gimmicky. And as soon as you hit those kind of psychological walls, those reservations, I, I just didn't feel like I wanted to be there anymore. And then I started beating myself up for resenting to be there. And I thought, well, I need to get over that because, you know, a day painting in any circumstance is a great day. Um, but I just, I, I just stopped doing my best work at them. And so I knew it was time. I knew I wanted to change tact. I knew I had to, to become a better painter because you tend to, you tend, you know, those events are so pressured in terms of how much you've got to produce in a short length of time that you tend to resort to the same tricks and formulas to get through the week, you know, or the same motifs because you know they're going to sell. And I just didn't want to be in that mindset anymore. I I just got to the point where it wasn't good for me. So, Um, and it's, it's hard because one, they'd made my name and two, I don't, I don't good money doing them. So, um, you know, it was, it was kind of hard, hard to say no, but I, I knew I had to, to continue to grow. So. Yeah. And the way I worded the question made it sound like I, I, th- I was implying that all plenary events are, are bad. And I, I don't feel that way. Oh, not at, at all. all. Yeah. Um, right. I, I, think I, there's, um, I think there's a place for them. I, I grew tremendously doing them. I met a lot of really great artists doing them. I got inspired and then for me to, continue to grow. I just had to quit. Um, so 
um, I knew that maybe, you know, in those events, you kind of do great paintings and you let them go, you sell them and you get home and you think, oh, I could have made that even better if I had had another shot at it in the studio, you know, with that as reference material. So yeah. um, I think it was from a growth point of view. I just knew I, ne- I needed to move on. And um, well, I may- maybe that's the thought- positive part of it is that it was yeah, a stepping, right. it was a stepping stone. Yeah, it's just a chapter, you yeah. know, and I don't, um, for me, they just didn't work anymore. And it was psychological more than me um, kind of moving on career wise. I was, I was really kind of creating a void by, by quitting doing them, but things came along to fill that void that pushed me to even greater depths. So, um, so it's all good. You know, one door closes and another door opens. Well, as well I'm, they I'm say. curious to hear about that. <laughs> you being pushed to greater depth. So how's that coming about? Well, I, when I quit the plane air events, there were two things that happened at the same time. And one was an invitation to join the insight gallery, um, down in Texas, which is, is a, just a super high caliber national level gallery um, <clears throat> with a lot of my, you know, favorite artists in it. Um, so I, you know, I knew I had to vastly improve my work to meet their standard. And then the other event that came along that I was invited to was the Maynard Dixon Country event, the old event um, that had a lot of um, – Again, my superior, you know, Matt Smith and Skip Wickham and yes. Len Schmiel and Dan Pinkham and just a lot of Ralph Oberg, a lot of great painters in that show. So, uh, yeah, suddenly I had to get better very fast. <laughs> 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 well, I think it says a lot about your work that you were invited to do that already. But uh, I, I think that's an important point for us to keep in mind. We should always be improving and, and polishing our skill never ending process it's never ending and that's one of the you know for everyone that's feeling the frustration i'm like well if this were easy you wouldn't be doing it right i think there's something about um the mindset of people that choose to do this they're intellectually curious they're up for the challenge um and essentially i think you're signing up for a, a lifelong journey of never ending learning and if you quit learning, you've kind of plateaued probably. Um, for me, that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, that I'm never going to be bored. Um, and that's a tremendous thought, you know, always going to be seeking, always going to need to learn more. So. I love that. It just seems like so many people today are easily bored. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, right. I, <laughs> maybe we kind of seek that easy thing and then we get there and we're like, Oh, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> You know, I actually need something stimulating and something challenging. And uh, yeah, I think how lucky we are that we're, we're always going to have that. You know, there's always more, there's always more to learn. It seems to be that painters are often polymaths. They're really interested in more than just just painting. It's uh, they observe many aspects of life and incorporate it. It yes. affects their their work. Right. Yes. Yeah. And I think um, I've spoken about this um, to people in the past, but just. Uh, you know, we struggle so much and spend a lot of money on therapy or yoga and, you know, to be present and spiritually centered and everything. And for me, there's, I'm not going to belittle it or anything, but there's, we're just very, very lucky to have the option of painting out in nature or in the studio and uh, uh, paying homage to something that's bigger than us. And I think painting itself is a all absorbing process that's um, extremely good for us yes. mentally. Yeah. I, I can vouch for that. <laughs> Except when I get aggravated and frustrated. I know, yeah, but, then, <laughs> but then, you know, even the burn pile once a year brings with it great satisfaction. So. <laughs> yeah, nothing like the smell of burning linseed oil <laughs> in canvas. Oh, so, I'm in well, the process of moving studios and I'm having great delight just, just, plowing through that stuff and getting rid of it. So, so you have new studio space. This I do. Yeah. We built, we bought the empty lots next door and, um, we built what had to be a house according to land use code. So it's a house with an extremely large living room and a very small kitchen, bathroom and bedroom. Of course. So, <laughs> it's one way of getting around the land use codes. Yes. So, um, 
<laughs> and the living room doesn't have uh, where well, it has big north lights that you can't see out of because they're high up, but um, you can see the tops of the trees and the sky. So um, it's the biggest. I don't know if you saw the photo go through Facebook a couple of weeks ago, but I want to. Uh, it's the, it's the first purpose built space that I will ever have worked in, and certainly the largest room. I've ever worked in. And um, just to reassure everyone out there, um, I have been working in the basement utility room <laughs> for the last eight years or what, however long and, um, you know, with no outside light. And yes, I was ready to, to give it up. But, um, you know, I've seen a lot of artists produce great work in the little spaces, you know, so it, it is possible. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm in, I call my space the dungeon. It's completely right. below ground. So, <laughs> yeah. But and uh, I'm glad I'm glad I don't have to go to the basement. It is nice to look out the window and see the forest. I have yeah. to say. So, yeah. Well, uh, you paid your dues. And <laughs> I paid my dues. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So that's great. I, I hope one day I get to see it. That'll be. Oh yes. That'd be a real yes. privilege. Well, you know, I'd like to back up a little bit. Uh, we were talking about plein air painting and um, outdoor painting, and and uh, I, that's still a big part of your life. It still informs your indoor work as well. And I'd like to like to address that a little bit more. How your how your outdoor paintings affect your studio work? Mm. Well, they are the source of everything for me. Um, what what has happened um, because I got a little burnt out on the plain air events where you are outdoors essentially to make a finished painting that's frameable and sellable. Um, once I quit doing those events, I promised myself I would never finish a painting outside again for the next three years. And, um, oh, that's just, interesting. never finished oh, a painting. My gosh, it just set me free because the point of painting outdoors is, to learn to see, to get accurate color notes from nature and to gather ideas. It is not about making finished paintings. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. And um, so I gave myself that break. And um, so I will go out and I'll, I'll do fairly raw studies, you know, gathering ideas, getting, focusing on the color notes that I know my camera isn't going to pick up on. For instance, um, shadows or reflected light cameras are pretty bad at picking up on those. So I, I will end up with fairly rough studies. Um, and, you know, I'll keep going unless the light changes um, for sure. But if it does change, I don't feel bad about quitting and leaving bare canvas because it's that color note information that I want to come home with. Um yeah, and that whole mentality just set me free of re redefining what I was hoping to achieve when I was outside. Um, because how many of us have actually lost good color note information by trying to finish a piece outside? <laughs> because, you know, yeah. it's three hours later and the lights change and you're trying to chase it and suddenly you end up screwing up everything that you had in there that was that was kind of pure, authentic observation turned into color mixing and uh so yes very much so i i don't intend my intention is not to produce a frameable piece if it if it happens and i cover the canvas that's great but that's not my intention anymore i like that it's it would yeah. be very liberating uh, yeah so when you're you're creating these unfinished pieces i mean are these like six by eights eight by tens nine by twelves um yeah, I tend to do like eight by tens up to eleven by fourteens. I find anything smaller than eight by ten a little, a little too small for me. And I think that's just the impact of studio work. In that, you know, when you're when you start doing thirty by forties frequently, suddenly a six by eight is scarily small. <laughs> it's not like, enough pixels. <laughs> not no, enough resolution. Yeah, <laughs> I would rather do an eleven fourteen and use a bigger brush. To be honest, so. Um, but yeah, and I think just going out, you know, if you're at, certainly if you're at the learning stage to go out, not to make paintings is a really, um, 
good mindset to go out with, um, with my students the first day of class or even, you know, if I'm in a landscape for the first time and I'm trying to tune in rather than make a painting, right? I'm trying to yeah. tune in. I'll get a 12, 16 divided into four. And just from standing in one spot, I will just do four little studies. And at that point, all I'm going for is big rough shapes and accurate color notes. And by the time I get to the fourth one, I'm kind of tuned in to the point where I know what I really want to focus on and paint because I think one of the big problems when we're painting outside is we, we get to a place, we know it's spectacular, but then how do you choose, oh, yeah. you know, what you're going to focus on? And so I, I call it my tuning in day. I just did it in Glacier when I was out there on the paint out with plain air painters of America. I, it was, it was so gorgeous and so overwhelming that I did a couple of those little boards just to, Help me tune in, you know, and it's amazing. Now you get that out in the studio and it's kind of, <clears throat> it's quite gnarly and ugly to look at, but it's got, you know, it's got some real good color references in it. So, um, you know, good information. So it's not a, it's not a slap dash painting, but it is one that's. Oh, it was okay. a little slap dash because it was so windy and oh. frankly, get the brush just to stick to the canvas for a split <laughs> second wasn't yeah. a cheap. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't belittling the paint. I was trying to picture the process. <laughs> but no, just the idea that we're not making paintings, you know, that that's not the point. The point is to go out there and be a student of nature. So, um, yeah, setting up a board, it takes away that pressure call and that yeah. you just set up a board and you just turn 360 and say, okay, I'll do a study of this tree with the mountain behind it, or I'll do a cloud study. And by the time you've got to the end of it, maybe hour and a half, you kind of, you're, you're tuned in, you know, you're right. seeing quite a lot. And then, and then you can turn around and do a eight by 10 study of maybe one of those ideas, you know, it's a great way of getting to know a place. From what I recall from your lecture at the booth, you talked about the the use of notans. You mentioned uh, mm. Arthur Dow's uh, book, mm -hmm. which I haven't got yet. I need to, I've got that on my wish list to, to buy, but uh, how does, how does the use of notans uh, uh, affect the development of your work? Well, it's a, it's a concept that I really started looking at a few years ago um, in a way to improve the design of the studio paintings more than anything. And the Arthur Wesley Dow book, <clears throat> I mean, it's good in terms of introducing the concept, but uh, the writing in it is pretty heavy. Um, heavy going. Um, <laughs> I think it's from the late 1800s. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and he goes into uh, Japanese printmaking and even, you know, dark and light pattern within um, decorative tiles, for instance, is, is included in that book. And it so it gets you to um, analyze a scene on maybe a different level um, to color, which I think is really healthy for me because I tend to really pop the color and get excited about that. And if you are, I, I don't call myself a colorist, but if you are a fan of color or high chroma, it's more important than ever that you recognize uh, and paint accurately your values. And it's also very important that you have a strong dark and light pattern. Um, so no tan theory, it's, it's fascinating. And it's simply a case of <clears throat> analyzing a scene and pushing all your darks to black and all your lights to white. And th there are several interpretations of that in that you could say, I'm going to push all my shadows to black and all my sunlit areas to white and see what I end up with. Or, for instance, if you're in a landscape that has a lot of cedar bushes or spruce trees, you could say, well, generally they're dark shapes against light, even though they might have light and shadow within them. So it's a very... It's a very flexible uh, theory in terms of interpretation. There's no right or wrong, um, but it's you know a it's one of those things. A good painting will have a very well designed dark and light pattern to it. One of them will dominate. It won't be a fifty fifty split. You know, were you to cut up all those shapes and measure their square square footage 
um, on the canvas. So it's really fascinating. And I've been rereading about Maynard Dixon recently, and um, I was reading a thesis online, and it mentioned him reading a couple of articles by German artists um, whose name I can't recall. I didn't recognize them. Um, but that really hit home to him was – um, he called them very influential on his, you know, involvement as a painter. And it was, those articles were to do with dark and light patterns. And you can see that in Maynard Dixon's work. I mean, if you just, if you take one of his paintings and run it through a, a notonizer app, um, a notonizer uh, app, just a notonizer app, but they do exist <laughs> Is that for the iPhone or Android. <laughs> yeah, I, I have one on my uh, iPhone. It's called notonizer. Yeah. Um, Oh, just even I, I sit down all the time with um, wax paper and Sharpie pens and just trace, you know. You're a big fan a of the painting. Sharpie pen. I'm a big fan of Sharpie pen. So tell us the benefits it's, of the Sharpie pen. Well, it's a definite mark. Um, so both yeah. in terms of trying to make, you know, your sketchbook is, is kind of where you make decisions and – um, you know, a fluffy, soft edge graphite thing for me doesn't make too many decisions on where, you know, shape should be or, you know, dark or light patterns. Um, and, and it might be useful to talk about that too. I think yeah. a lot of people with their sketchbooks, you know, this idea of doing thumbnails, um, I think if you just do the one, you're asking it to make a lot of decisions for you within just the one. So I like breaking my thumbnails down. And, you know, when I teach, I teach one principle per day. So we'll focus on establishing four or five big shapes or within that same view, um, looking at the dark and light pattern, looking at no tan theory. And then another layer might be, well, how many values is required to carry the scene? And, and I thinking, I think having one thumbnail for each of those uh, is a lot, um, easier to process and then easier to analyze than trying to expect one thumbnail to cover everything within right. one little sketch. So, so the danger is, is not to treat the thumbnail as if you were just doing the painting itself. Right. Uh, if, if that's, yeah, hopefully so I'm understanding I, that I like right. I it down. Yeah. yeah. So let's do a bunch of thumbnails, just concentrating on the four or five big shapes and then, you know, perhaps changing those shapes or making sure that two aren't the same yeah. um, in terms of, you know, that, shape energy or in terms of their size. Um, and then maybe do another series of thumbnails looking at the dark and light patterns within each one. So in a way I kind of, you know, I break the thumbnails down into a simple, um, concept. And then, you know, for the final painting, you're layering each of those on top of each other as it were. So. Well, what I remember from your lecture. Sense. Yeah, <laughs> it, well it does. And, and it's good to hear it again because it's bringing back to mind some of the things that you talked about uh, back at the booth was, you know, you were talking about the sketchbook is not the place for pretty, pretty drawings. It's it's oh, the place right. where you experiment. Yeah. And, and I get my students to do that and you just see massive light bulbs come on and the shop is great because there is no <laughs> hesitant mark. If you're saying, okay, I'm going to put, I, I don't know if you remember from the booth museum, Len Schmiel's um, PowerPoint. Oh, yeah where he simply was using Sharpie pens actually in his sketch and just saying, well, you know, even in terms of placing land mass versus sky and where you place that horizon line within the context of those four edges, I mean, and he was pointing out that he quite often liked to go high, you know, with it and split the canvas, you know, three quarters a quarter or something even less than that ratio. And uh, the Sharpie pen, it makes a definite mark. So even for breaking a rectangle into two shapes, um, it's great. It's, well, a, it's a great tool to have. <laughs> I, I went out and bought a bunch of Sharpies after your Excellent. presentation. <laughs> now I've got to find now, a, a sketchbook point, that won't bleed right. through. <laughs> Yes, and they do exist, actually. Um, and then, obviously, too, with the Sharpie pen, there's no way of erasing that mark. So if you do screw up, you have to start a new sketch. Move on. And I yeah. like that because um, by the time you've got through four or five or six, everything's improved. You're improving everything on every layer 
um, conceptually each time you start a new sketch. So by the time you come to painting, hopefully you have something, you know, you really know where those entry and exit points are on the edges of the canvas for those big shapes. And, um, you know, you have a dark and light pattern established. And, uh, yeah, I really, I really love it as a tool. Well, I, it, it, it was an eye opener to me as an, cause, uh, you know, I just had, I guess I was naive about it as I right. am for, for many things, but this whole idea of experimenting with different ideas like that, I mean, it sounds obvious to someone that's experienced, but to a beginner, you, you don't even know where to begin sometimes. And this idea of experimenting with little uh, thumbnails or no tan sketches or whatever, you know, just experimenting yeah. before you commit a hundred dollars worth of paint to, to right. a large canvas, uh, right. it makes a whole lot of sense. And it's it's incredible. You only need to do ten minutes of that, and the result will be infinitely improved than where you had you kind of jumped right in with paint on the canvas. I, th I think another idea that uh, I heard you at Spouse is uh, the idea of doing multiple versions of, of a similar painting. Yes. And that yes. is <laughs> that that was such a novel idea to me because it seems like once I had it down on the on the canvas, it was time to move on, even even though it wasn't all that good, you know, but. I, right. like, I like I like this idea. You want to expound on that a little bit for us? Well, I think some of that comes from uh, I started out in watercolor and, um, you know, fairly tight and traditional. And then probably by the time I was 17, 18, 19, I was really into kind of washier watercolors, a lot more abstracted, experimental uh, and certainly with that medium. Um, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. You only have limited control. And I was, you, I was doing everything, you know, throwing salt into it and drying it with a hairdryer, dunking them in a full bathtub, you know, to get some oh, of it wow. to wash off yeah. again using masking tape. And, you know, because there were so many unknowns in terms of what was going to happen. I mean, you might have an intention and a hope, but it might not, it might not come to fruition was that I would get two or three versions going at the same time and work on them all, um, a little differently. So that, you know, that felt very appropriate for watercolor, um, in oil, which I switched to when I was probably mid twenties. Um, what I found was, I mean, I love the medium um, and it's a little bit more predictable in terms of handling than watercolor is. Um, but what I found, you know, I just want to be the best painter I can be. And I'm naturally optimistic. So <laughs> um, often, you know, I'll work hard on a painting. I'll do all the prep work, the field studies, um, the thumbnails, prepare for a studio piece. And bring it to some kind of conclusion and then I'll wake up the next morning and think, Oh, I can do it so much better now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's almost like the first version was a roadmap and maybe now that I have a roadmap, I can really push brushwork edges, the surface texture because I know where I'm going. And so I don't hesitate to do that. And I don't feel bad about doing that. I mean, musicians and writers will do several recordings or several drafts, and I don't see why I need to kill version one to try and finish it. Right. So I don't, I don't hesitate in thinking as soon as I have that thing, you know, that sensation of, I know, I know how this is evolving and I know where it's going, but I can get the surface texture better now. Then I just pick up another blank canvas and maybe work on two at the same time. Maybe they go in different directions, but um, I think to invest everything in that one canvas and just, you know, expect it to have all the answers and then to look fresh, like you just hatched it effortlessly is asking a lot. So, um, but that's my style. You know, I like it to look um, fresh and spontaneous, even though it's actually quite thoroughly planned and thought out. You had worked as an art handler at one time. And is there any lesson that you've learned that helped that would help us as artists going forward to make future art handlers jobs easier. Oh, you mean from an archival point of view? Yes. Mm -hmm. I know 
ooh, I can't remember what artist I was talking to, but I think they used to sign their paintings with a Sharpie pen or something that was supposedly permanent, but oh. it turned out not to be. Oh, <laughs> so, no. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I well, think. Well, you know, a lot of acrylic painters do that. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it may have even been Scott Christensen. I know it probably was and that he started signing with something and then realized that it was just, it was either fading or it was being absorbed into that ground. Um, but definitely signing work, um, on the front. And I also sign on the back and I rub a stamp it. I have a book. So every painting that gets released for sale has a inventory number and that's in a ledger. Um, good photographs, um, I will often too sign the frame because I know when we worked at the portrait gallery, a big part of, you know, I dealt with a lot of inquiries on whether the portrait that was in for consideration or maybe someone that sent in a photo, you know, whether it was authentic or not, you know, looking at the canvas and the stretcher bar and the frame that it's in, um, you know, all provide clues. So, I kind of mark up as much as I can um, in terms of making sure that it's known that it's mine. Um, I think that's important to do. Um, yeah, and, and just using as archivally sound materials as you can. Um, I had a little email conversation with, I like putting some gesso on my bigger studio pieces to create you know, um, variance in texture rather than just dealing with a, a weave that's regular across the whole surface is changing it up a little bit. Well, if you're using an acrylic gesso, it's really important that the, the surface, if you're working on prime canvas is pure acrylic. And I was suspicious about one of the ones I was looking at and, and wrote to the gesso manufacturer golden. And they sent me some conservator reports on, doing a water droplet test on hmm. supposed acrylic primed canvases that were sold that way. Um, and they, and they had, you know, they were measuring the curve of the edge of the water droplet and saying that depending on the shape of that water droplet, you could tell whether there was actually any oil that had been put in there as a, as a binder to, you know, particularly. Oh, wow. I, I wouldn't, I, I would have never thought of that. Yeah. And of course, if there's anything other than acrylic, if they were putting in oil to make it an easier application, then you should not be putting an acrylic gesso on top. So, um, you know, and just using archival materials and being aware of rules like that. And um, obviously, um, a really, you know, good quality final varnish if you can. Um, that's the downside of a lot of the plain air events in that. Or, you know, you only really have the opportunity to spray it with, you know, aerosol retouch varnish and, you know, down the line that's going to be absorbed by the paint ground and uh, it would need to be refinished. So, yeah, for a while there I was putting rubber stamps on the back with with a date in which that painting could receive a final varnish layer. You're meant to give an oil painting at least six months um, before you put on a a final varnish. Are you using like Gamvar? Is that what Gamvar you're using? is yeah. what's come out recently? Yeah, yeah, in terms of you can put that on when a painting is touch dry. I can, I can talk about the geeky stuff all day oh, long. Oh, I, I love it. <laughs> geeking it out, I call yeah. it. <laughs> Jill, Jill Carver, geeking it out. That's well. well you know, my, well, I just I'm impressed, but you know, these are things that I don't think about, and I'm. Th right. and I'm so I'm yeah. tr trying to figure it all out, you know. And My husband would always ask me, he says, how, how late were you all sitting up last night, you know, at some event or something? And I was like, oh, I think we got till two or three drinking whiskey. He's like, <laughs> what do you all talk about at two o'clock in the morning? And I said, canvas surfaces mostly. <laughs> and that's very true. We're easily amused. <laughs> The more whiskey and the more length of time that has passed, the more it gets down to brushes and canvases. <laughs> yes. See, it's not all about the intellectual 
part of designing a painting. It's the tools and the right. and the materials. The we love it. <laughs> and we're sure that once we hit the right canvas surface or we get the right brush or we buy the right easel, that we're going to be so much better. Of so, course. Yeah. Of course. It's a constant that's, pursuit. That's the silver bullet, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, so I am looking for the silver bullet. <laughs> okay, so what, yeah. what, what, can, what canvas do you, what surfaces do you prefer to paint on? You know, I mix it up. So when I'm when I'm working small and outside, I like a fine linen surface, or I like a um, like a a gessoed board, but one that I've gessoed myself. And what I do is I build up maybe two or three layers of gesso with alternating um, brush directions in terms of applying that gesso therefore i end up with almost a linen type textured surface but it's just got a little it's a fast surface but it's got a little bit of a tooth to it the downside of gesso is a lot of them have so much um like a chalk um chalk in them as a as a material yeah, that yeah, it, marble it dust gets, yeah. yeah, the marble dust. It, it's very absorbent and it just sucks the oil paint out. I like using golden gesso because the paint still sits on the surface. You get that beautiful luminosity from a white gesso, um, but it, the paint stays on top. It doesn't get sucked dry. So I like, yeah, portrait linen or a gessoed board for outside. And then when I'm working on big studio pieces, I tend to buy um, – a thicker linen texture or a cotton duck. And then I make sure it's a hundred percent acrylic and I'll put a little gesso on top just to get rid of some of the tooth on the one hand. And then on the other to make that surface a little less regular throughout, you know, a little bit more variation of texture, but I, I don't, I don't put it on thick. Um, and I have alternated, I have to say between, you know, that half inch gator board is great for larger studio pieces because you can cut it to um, exactly the size that you want to suit the designs. You can come up with the design that really uh, showcases your motif to its utmost. Um, and that's great because you can cut those, you know, those half inch gator boards to size. And they're so lightweight. <clears throat> to accommodate that. And they're lightweight. But I've also gone back to a deep stretched canvas because my work can be hung either traditional or contemporary, you know, broadly speaking. And, um, a lot of my clients are going towards, um, on, particularly on the big pieces, um, floater frames and, you know, a deep stretched canvas edge looks a heck of a lot better in a floater frame where you see the edge of the canvas than half inch gator board. It doesn't work well for that kind of, framing finish yeah yeah i like that look it's a it's a yeah. beautiful look yeah 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 I, I've, I've been experimenting with that as as well but um i mean it's, it's it's interesting i had a conversation a few weeks ago with tom bassett that runs um wood river fine arts and ketchum and uh you know he's worked at claggett ray gallery for over 30 years he's got a lot of experience he was saying a lot of people that are building these kind of contemporary shop line homes think that they have to go, you know, for more modern abstract art to fill them. And that might not be their taste. And he's showing them, well, actually, you can have a fairly traditional looking landscape painting, but just frame it. Um, more modern, you know, a little sleeker, uh, maybe a thinner frame. It doesn't have to be ornate and gold leaf and carved for it to look fantastic. And he's been doing that a lot with some of his recent clients too. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because, you know, I just read, I can't remember the source. I wish I, I, I could remember where I read this, but I think it said uh, about 90% of uh, all paintings that are bought are, are decorative and they tend to be abstract today. That's the trend right now. I'm okay. not saying that's what we should be doing, yeah. <laughs> you know, but his approach is interesting because maybe yeah. that addresses the reasons why people are going that route. Right. And often, you know, even at the Insight Galleries, traditional work as they do um, generally carry, um, it is interesting that my work can really go either way. And I, I do often, you know, kind of vary up the frames that I'm giving them just to show 
customers that you can get a different look but end up still end up with something you know the landscape that you love you know so well your paintings are are, are quite beautiful in the colors that you choose what what is on your color palette um i work with the standard palette in fact well there's a funny story because when i lived in england i had very much an english palette full of earth tones and um <laughs> sap green, Payne's gray, you know, burnt umber, very English, <laughs> like straight from an Edward Sego painting or something, yeah. or John Constable. And then I moved to um, Texas and none of that worked for me <laughs> anymore. Surprise, surprise. So at that point, I switched to a primary color palette and went back to basics. And I would also say for anyone starting out, um, don't load up your palette with a lot of different tubes of color if you haven't tried working with just blue, red, and yellow. It's it's fundamental to understanding color and um, and how we, how it works and how we see. So I that's exactly what I did. I started out with cad red light, ultramarine blue, and cad yellow light, and then I expanded into essentially a a warm and cool and a dark and lighter. Um, value of each of those primaries. So I'm still working with a primary color palette. So right now I have ultramarine blue and cobalt. I have alizarin and cad red light, and I have a cad orange and a cad yellow light. And so essentially it's still a primary color palette. And I, I will add other tubes into that just as a speed thing. I'll add yellow sure. ochre, or maybe I'll switch out you know, one of the yellows for a, a cat lemon, um, as well as a cat yellow light. So, but yeah, essentially a primary color palette and that goes for outdoors and indoors. The delight of that is I know that if I'm traveling and hiking, I can reduce that substantially, um, and have a pretty, I, I'd cut out the cobalt. I would probably cut out the cat red light if I had a lizard and cat orange on there. Um, and I could cut out one of the yellows and I know I can get down to, you know, four tubes, if four or five tubes, if I had to. What, what brands? I, I use gambling as yeah. Yeah. I like the pigment quality. Um, I think that ultramarine blue is one of the best out there and they, they don't manufacture an ultramarine blue deep because their ultramarine blue is so, full of pigment yeah um it's a beautiful blue and i've tried more expensive brands and i i come back there so you know in terms of consistency of paint as it comes out the tube you know the viscosity of the paint i think it's fairly consistent it's very buttery it doesn't separate out into you know some tubes you open and you get a bunch of stiff paint and then a bunch of oil <laughs> come rushing out. Uh, I like the buttery consistency. I don't I don't really thin it down. I use it pretty much as it comes out the tube, which is which is great. It saves time, right? It makes it's less to think about. Um, yeah, and I think for their price point, there's good pigment quality. Are you using mediums of any sort, or just paint straight out of the out of the tubes? I am just a purist, Carl. It's like I don't need more stuff. Like if you're going to add more stuff, you have to know why you're adding it. And like I said, you know, I love the consistency of the paint. So all I then carry is Gamsol as a, as a brush wash and a, a little clean cup of Gamsol if I do need to thin. Maybe if it's cold and you need to thin the white down, which is fairly common, you know, that the white will get fairly stiff. But um, yeah, I, I really don't have a lot of equipment. Um, you know, I, I mix mix with a brush instead of a palette knife. Um, so that's one less thing to carry. So, um, well, I think I yeah. bought a jar jar of each medium that's available from from gam right. gambling, <laughs> and and they're all beginning to gel up now. <laughs> Right. Um, I do use the, if I'm working on a big studio piece, I do use the Galkid yeah. or Galkid, I forget how it's pronounced here. Um, I do use that 50-50 um, with Gamsol to oil out a painting. If I'm coming back in to work something that's been set up, I, I do use that medium for oiling out in the studio. Do you but use I, their I, fast mat I, paints as I, well? I, no, I've not tried them. Yeah. I haven't so. either, so I don't know. 
the, co- the, the wetter they stay, the better chances I have of making it right is my view. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so well, that's good, that's good actually, advice. <laughs> I keep my studio fairly cold because I want, you know, particularly on those big pieces, I want a good run at it. So the wetter oh. it stays, the better. Yeah. Well, Colorado's a good place. Exactly. (laughs) And, um, you know, if I'm working on a field study that I really, you know, I'm excited about and maybe it's a sunrise piece. So, you know, uh, you kind of need two or three shots at it time wise because it happens so quickly. Um, You know, what you're looking at kind of disappears. Then I'll stick it in the freezer. And that's a good way of instead of trying to ruin a piece because, it's hard enough to paint when it's in front of you, right? It's even hard enough to paint when it happened an hour ago, but you're trying to finish a piece. (laughs) So um, it's time to quit and put it in the freezer and then I'll go back out the next day. So, yeah. Well, well, one thing that's uh, uh, interesting about your work too, is you are painting not only large, but you're using uh, interesting aspect ratios in your paintings. Uh, This one (laughs) that I, that you sent me earlier uh, let's see if I, I can't remember the name of it. Big Ben Morning. It's twenty inches oh, by sixty inches. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I I enjoyed the panoramic ones. Um, it's Cinemascope. It's Cinemascope. Um, yeah, one to three ratio, and uh, it's a re- if you're designing, it's just a really um, fun format to kind of work with in terms of you know, having to consider, you know, where the eye enters and how it moves around and how you get to your focal point. Um, but I, I love that format, particularly, I think that was a big bend piece that I sent you. So yeah, particularly for those big Western vistas, you, you think it's very appropriate for the landscape and you're, that you're dealing with such wide panoramic views, but it's actually quite challenging design wise to do that. So I, I like that format and I like slightly off squares. So I think I sent you another one too, that was like 21 by 23 and then there was one 24 by 27. Yeah. Just a little off square. Um, yeah. Great fun to work with. That's cool. There's just so many options and, and things to experiment with. And I, and I think that's what I appreciated, um, uh, about you, uh, listening to your lectures and, you know, this idea of experimenting and, yeah. And really pushing the boundaries of what we right. learn, always learning, enjoy the process. Uh, you know, that's that's a good lesson. And I really appreciate you sharing that with us. What I think, uh, it, yeah, I think it's one of the most fun aspects of what we do. And I think once you get caught up in the professional side of things and deadlines and everything, it's really, for me, a treat is to set aside a week with no expectations and just uh, just um, try new things out you know it's it's kind of rare to have that time to just kind of have that play time you know have that experimental time I like that what are you reading these days <laughs> I'm reading a lot of books on Maynard Dixon because I'm I'm doing this show coming up that's going to be a homage to Maynard Dixon at um, the Medicine Man Gallery in um, March I believe that is next year so I'm trying to resolve in my head, you know, where I first came across Dixon and how he's inspired me. So it actually led me to kind of read beyond that and and read uh, a little bit more about his background and his life. It's fun. I mean, I I read a lot of fiction. I read a lot of nonfiction about landscapes that I'm like when I first moved to Texas, I read a lot of uh, John Graves um, goodbye to a river and hard scrabble, you know, writings about that land, because I find through reading and through writing that I, I learned so much. It it helps me tune in as a visual artist, you know, and yeah, my husband's an English professor too. So literature's kind of a big part of, of our lives, uh, in general, but yeah, kind of learning about the West, um, Wallace Stegner, you know, John Muir, I mean, reading all of that is, yeah, someone that writes beautifully and visually about a landscape. I I find that material really invaluable. So I'll go through phases where I really kind of try and tune in on that level. Well, I think it shows in, in, in your work and, uh, your philosophy. Uh, I, one thing I remember from uh, the event as well is 
Uh, you mentioned that painting is like poetry. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. I, and I just love that, that expression. You quoted James Whistler, I believe it was. If music is the poem of sound, then painting is the poem of sight. And, yeah. and I yeah. think that comes through in your work. Right, right. And I think, um, you know, I think landscape painting can be journalism in that sense. But I, again, that's a personal choice. You know, for me, when I'm looking at the painting, it's not just about what it's of. It's about getting a sense of the artist and what that place means to them. And the fact that that interpretation was very personal, Um I, you know, for me, it should be, it should be more poetry than a documentary as such, you know. Yes. Where could people find out about you, Jill? My website is jillcarver.com. And uh, yeah, there's some links on there to magazine articles and so forth. Podcasts, including this one, there'll be a link there soon. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I could keep on going on, but uh, I don't know that I can stay up to 2 a.m. in the morning. (laughs) Okay. I'm getting old. So that's that's when we get to, that's when we get to the real secrets, yeah. though. Well, you well, know that'll have to be part two of this episode. <laughs> well, I think that would be a fun a fun theme. Is that it's all very well to do when we're kind of smart and drinking tea at ten o'clock in the morning, but you know you need a series of podcasts. You know the whiskey hour. There you, know. you go. The insights of Len Schmiel and Skip Whitcomb <laughs> drinking whiskey at eleven o'clock. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you for being on the uh, Artful Painter podcast. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. Jill was an absolute delight to talk with today. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I sense that we only began to scratch the surface of what she knows. What a wealth of information, of, of knowledge of the craft and a deep love of nature and landscape painting. I'm sure there's much, much more to be gleaned from talking with Jill. You can check out her work at jillcarver.com. She also offers uh, the occasional workshop, and those would be well worth attending. There's more coming to The Artful Painter, so make sure you don't miss a single episode. And the way you do that is to sign up for The Artful Painter email list. Each time a new episode comes out, you'll get a reminder from me in your inbox Sign up at theartfulpainter.com or carlolson.tv. Both go to the same place. And I do love hearing from you. Uh, When you get an email from me, all you have to do is hit reply and send me your comments. So I enjoy that. For example, here's a note from Meredith in response to episode number five with Dan Young. She says, what an awesome episode. I sat outside and sketched as I listened. And I had a good laugh over his reaction to being told his paintings look like a photograph. People really think that is a compliment when most of us just want to create a beautiful moving painting. I'm a newbie as well and have only been painting for almost two years. I think starting out with the maturity not to be discouraged is an asset. Always learning, always growing. Thank you, Meredith. Hey, Meredith, I appreciate those uh, comments and you're so right. Uh, You know, having that uh, starting out with the maturity not to be discouraged is an asset. So, uh, Yeah, let's keep on learning. I'll learn along with you there. So here's another uh, bit of feedback I got. Now, there's an alias to this one, so I don't really know who is behind it. Uh, The alias is Brick Clone. And this person says, these are really good. Talking about the podcast episodes. Uh, Brick Clone continues. I did a painting the other week because these inspired me. Keep up the good work. Wow, Brick Clone, I'm proud of you. Man, that's fantastic. Uh, I have to give credit to the guests on the show, though. So keep listening to them and keep on painting. And for all of you listeners out there, keep those comments coming. I appreciate your support of the show. Thank you for listening to The Artful Painter. Now it's your turn. Go out there and paint something amazing.